I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times and welcome to the New York Times Close Up. On this program, we feature leading newsmakers and the New York Times journalists who are covering them. This week, Times culture critic A.O. Scott joins us to share what he really thinks about the movies now that he stepped away from his role as the Times film critic. But first, politics in New York and internationally collided this week as local politicians reacted to the Mideast and to migrants. Pro and anti-Israel demonstrations and statements of support prompted a backlash. We're joined by Times Metro Desk reporters Nicholas Fandos. He's been following the local reaction, as has Metro reporter Jeff Mays, who covered Mayor Adams' recent trip to Latin America and attempt to mitigate the inundation of migrants to New York City. Welcome to both of you. The action in the Middle East, the attack by Hamas on Israel, what has been the local reaction to that? And how has it affected people in New York who have been critical of Israel in the past and have been supportive of the Palestinian cause? Nick? Yeah, well, I think, Sam, the first thing to, it's worth pointing out is, you know, this is uh, an issue that's happening thousands of miles away, but in many ways it feels very local here in New York. This, after all, is the city with the largest Jewish population outside of Israel. Um, it's also the city that's kind of the birthplace of the modern left, which has had Palestinian rights and Palestinian solidarity as a key tenant um, of its kind of policy platform. And with the Palestinian population as well. Right, that's true as well. So there's been a real kind of collision and strain, I think, uh, among those forces. So we saw this weekend, um, really uh, just hours after um, you know, the attack unfolded in Israel and the real cost of that was coming into view, uh, some Palestinian solidarity groups planned a big rally in Times Square, which was then promoted by the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, there are obviously several elected politicians. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is one of them, uh, who's well known and associated with them. Um, this rally turned out to be, you know, super inflammatory. Uh, there were people there cheering on the missile strikes, et cetera. And it had a big afterlife in New York politics, where basically mainline Democrats and a lot of um, Jewish Democrats were saying basically to AOC and others, you don't disavow, disavow this. If, AO, if DSA doesn't separate itself from it, um, you, you know, you're dead to us. You, 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 you're basically anti-Semitic. You hate Jews. And it, it turned into this really intense, passionate debate between, uh, you know, different factions basically on the left that are often aligned with each other, but see this issue uh, pr pretty differently. Jeff, is that going to become a litmus test for the left now? And and how do they separate support for Palestinians, who clearly are in need of help generally, with Hamas, which is clearly a terrorist group? Yeah, I think it's already brought up those old fault lines that were already in existence, right? There was questions for, you know, if you were up for a DSA endorsement, questions about how you felt about Israel and, and Palestine and the, and the relationship between the two. So those fault lines already existed. Um, I think what we're seeing now from the left, surprisingly, is, you know, people who are big progressive names like AOC, uh, Jamal Bowman, congressman, uh, who admitted that he recently let his DSA membership lapse, uh, we're seeing a real sort of discerning from them on how they should talk about this issue. And it's been a very delicate line, even down to progressive council members. And what they basically have tried to walk this line and say, we condemn what happened with the Hamas attacks. At the same time, we want to look at the larger historical relationship between Israel and, and Palestine. And so it remains to be seen how that is going to play out. But certainly politicians like Governor Hochul and Eric Adams have taken this opportunity to hammer the left and to sort of play along those old fort, li fort lines and use this situation to their advantage to show their support for Israel while questioning whether uh, progressives really have uh, that support for Israel. Now that, uh, and of course we're talking uh, late in the week and things can change, but now that uh, Netanyahu has formed a sort of unity war cabinet, uh, have 
uh, positions on the left changed at all toward him? Are people becoming a little more tolerant of his policies, or is it a wait-and-see attitude to see now what he does, if anything, substantively? I think it's more of a wait-and-see attitude, and I think that there's a, you know, an understanding that as Israel begins to undertake a, a counteroffensive, you know, things could be pretty ugly and grisly. You could see a lot of civilians killed in Gaza, um, and that's just going to make the politics of all this that much more complicated. Um, you know, uh, it's hard to, as somebody told me for a piece I wrote this week, this is a really hard moment to have nuance. And if you've been relying on a nuanced view of this whole situation, you're going to be under an incredible amount of pressure to pick a side here. Um, and so I don't, I don't see this going away. And I think for now, you know, a, a lot of the politicians that are feeling a squeeze on this feel like, okay, we got through the first days of it, but um, you know, it's just going to become more complicated. Other events taking place outside the city that are affecting all of us here. Uh, the migrant crisis. Mayor Adams was in Latin America talking to migrants, saying, we love you, but don't come here. It's going to be worse for you if you do. Uh, Jeff, is that going to have any impact? Well, even the mayor himself admitted that him going to Latin America, he went to the Darien Gap, for example, even against the advice of Colombian authorities. Uh, even the mayor admitted that that may not have an effect. Uh, you know, when you have people fleeing the conditions that they're fleeing, uh, economic, lack of economic opportunity, uh, threats of violence, you know, people that are going through the Darien Gap, which is the stretch of jungle that is very dangerous uh, uh, pathway, uh, they are going to take that risk to come here. They are willing to take that risk to come here. Uh, so Mayor Adams and even Governor Hochul have really called for a decompression strategy uh, from the national government. They've called more for more help from the federal government in taking care of the migrants that are here. But to be honest, Mayor Adams' trip has been criticized as potentially uh, maybe being a waste and not accomplishing what he sought out well, to do. I, I think it's just highlighted, too, you know, how few options he has. Like, you know, the idea that he's going to take one trip down there and tens of thousands of people who have put their lives on the line and at stake to make this arduous journey are going to just say, oh, the mayor of New York City says, actually, it's not that great there. Never mind. Um, that's not going to happen. Not to mention the fact he, pent he spent part of this trip when he was in Mexico actually trying to lure companies and business interests to come to New York and say, hey, this is a great place to be. So, What's that mixed message? And, and I guess more to the point, who's it even going to reach that's making this journey? You know, people I think that are on it are hearing from people um, who they may know, family, friends who are already in New York, and are going to take their kind of point of view and whatever they're reporting back with a lot more authority than what the mayor says. Given that this is a national problem, uh, given the fact that uh, court rulings have been against the city, uh, is the mayor getting a bad rap on this issue? I don't know if he's getting a bad rap. It's certainly a complex issue. Uh, and I think he has asked for some leeway uh, from the courts. The city has a what's called the right to shelter mandate where they have to house people when they ask for it. He's asked for relief from that, saying that that right to shelter when it was originally created 40 years ago was not designed to house the uh, more than 100,000 uh, migrants that have arrived, more than 60,000 who are still in the city's care. Uh, Governor Hochul has joined him in supporting uh, that. But, you know, advocates are really concerned that not only would migrants be affected if the right to shelter was altered, but regular New Yorkers who are experiencing homelessness would also be affected. Uh, and there's also concern that once you relieve that right to shelter, you may see sort of what we've seen in other cities, which is encampments on street, more homeless people, uh, more migrants who are turned out to the street because the city's no longer obligated to house them. Governor Hochul has now joined the mayor in asking for that right to shelter mandate be lifted or at least uh, uh, be lessened somewhat. Explain to me, I'm not a constitutional lawyer, but why doesn't that mandate apply statewide rather than just in New York City since it is based on the state constitution? The city's argument has been that it does apply statewide and that they should be getting help uh, from the state in terms of placing uh, these migrants. The problem is that many of the county executives have passed uh, orders, executive orders, preventing uh, migrants from being sent there, which has really chilled the city's effort to send migrants out of the city. Governor Hochul has refused to sort of, uh, you know, uh, fight those orders uh, and has 
said instead that the federal government should step up uh, and help. So this is all in court right now. Uh, the court, the judge is going to have to make some decisions on whether the city can actually get relief from this longstanding right to shelter. And, and I just add that that right to shelter, I think it's important to understand, comes not from a, a settled legal case where a judge ultimately ruled and said, you know, um, the state or the city has to shelter these people. It was based on a settlement in a case that was reached. So there was never fully adjudicated. There is some language in the state constitution, which is, was used when the suit was brought, you know, 40 years ago, which suggests maybe it would extend statewide. But that question just hasn't fully been decided by a judge. That's why the city has this unique obligation. The state has an obligation to help it. But, um, you know, if you're a, a homeless person in Syracuse, at least right now, there's, there's no mandate on the book that you get, you know, a bed in the same way you would in New York City. Jeff, the mayor has called his persistent critics fools and buffoons. Is he being a little too thin-skinned? No mayor likes critics. Absolutely. I mean, if historically, if you look from Giuliani uh, to Koch, even Bloomberg, Bill de Blasio frequently criticized the media. Uh, it's a difficult job. It's a tough job. The difference is Mayor Adams claims to be thick skinned. He, he has this expression where he says he's going to turn his haters into his waiters. Uh, that hasn't always been the case. The mayor has responded in ways that some people uh, are concerned about. Uh, calling people fools and buffoons, for example. Uh, and it don't, doesn't show that he does have this thick skin. Being the mayor of New York City, you're going to face persistent criticism. How you deal with it can affect your sort of larger policy and also the outlook. Indeed it can. Jeff Mays, Nicholas Fandos of the New York Times, and coming up, former Times film critic A.O. Scott wonders if it's still worth going to the movies. For more than two decades, sitting down to watch a movie has been a part of A.O. Scott's job description, a duty. So when he left his post in March as film critic for the New York Times, he did anything but. This summer, he returned to the movie theaters, but as just another moviegoer, joining many others who were also getting back to an enjoyable pastime that had been put on hold. New York Times book review critic at large A.O. Scott writes about what makes a trip to the movie so important in this week's New York Times magazine as he asks himself, is it still worth going to the movies? Tony, so what's the answer? Is it? Um, the, the, the shocking answer is yes, yes it is. Um, and uh, I wasn't necessarily surprised to discover that um but i felt like i was coming back to a to a part of myself to a part of my own experience to the part of to a part of the world that i'd in a way been missing out on for a long time um not just because of of uh you know of the pandemic and the fact that people were going to the movies less um i was still going to the movies a lot or going to screenings a lot but i hadn't been uh um, to the movies just as kind of a regular person buying a ticket and going to the movies um, since the beginning of the century. So uh, it was it was it was very new and very familiar to me in a way. So, Tony, was this the old normal or a new new normal? Um, it felt like the old normal, um, which was one of the things that was exciting about it in a way. Um, I was. Uh, you know, I, I was not in New York. I was in a in a, a small vacation town on the New England coast, where there were these um, old, you know, Main Street movie theaters that have been refurbished into uh, kind of nonprofit art centers that sometimes show first run movies. And everyone had come out. All of the locals and and a lot of the summer people um, had come out in late August to see Barbie and to see Oppenheimer, which was an old fashioned phenomenon. And I, you know, a movie comes out, two movies come out and everyone wants to go see them and everyone wants to talk about them and everyone wants to bring their friends and people want to go back and see them again. But that's something that we hadn't had for a very long time. And there was a conventional wisdom emerging even before the pandemic that said that that was over, that people weren't going to go to the movies that way anymore. People were going to go out a couple of times a year to go see a big blockbuster, to see a franchised movie like a Marvel movie or a Star Wars movie or maybe a Pixar movie. But otherwise, people are going to stay home and watch things on streaming. And the the golden age of communal movie going, 
um, was um, supposed to be over. And what we don't know is whether this was was something of an anomaly or a throwback um, or, or or a one shot or whether um, something like the old habit of movie going, which had been very much in decline among audiences for a very long time, might be creeping back um, into into the mainstream. As Tony, you wrote in the Times, uh, movie going has been pronounced dead many times before. Uh, now it has uh, been written off uh, because streaming seems to be the next phase, the next new thing. Uh, why does it seem to be different this time? Why uh, has streaming not replaced it, or at least not yet? Well, I mean, streaming has certainly eaten into it, and I and I think that the 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 place that you know what they call theatrical distribution, what we call movie going, holds within the overall movie or motion picture economy is going to be smaller. I, I, I just I think that that's that that's true, that the the convenience of streaming, the abundance of material that's available on streaming, the fact that you can watch it on any any screen and that people now have um, in, in their homes, you know, rather nice screens that they're that they're used to watching things on um, without the distractions of other people and with the 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 possibility to, you know, to pause the, the 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 image if you if you if you need to use the bathroom rather than trying to calculate the right time to sneak out of your row and walk past everyone, um, but but I think that there is there are aspects of the experience of going to the movies that are not replaceable and that people will continue and do continue to seek out as part of an overall menu of of options because now we can watch almost anything we want almost any place we want at almost any time we want. So the choice to go to leave the house and go to the movies and sit in a dark room with a bunch of strangers is a different kind of choice. You said that streaming has turned into a consumer habit that is a major cultural disaster. Why is that? Well, that, was, that was a little bit of hyperbole, but I do think that the the as with many things um, that come to us digitally um, that seem first of all to be enormously convenient in ways that we had never imagined before. You know, you don't you don't have to call a cab and wait in the rain for a cab. You can you can go on Uber. Um, you 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 know um, you you don't have to call someone on the phone. You can ping them on social media. Um, and all of these solutions to problems that weren't maybe really problems. Um, and I. I think that one of the things that happens with streaming is that it accelerates the the conversion, the translation of everything, of all movies, of all television into content, into sort of an undifferentiated um, just sea of content that we navigate with the help of an algorithm. So streaming makes us much more passive, much more isolated, much, I think, lazier as, as consumers of visual entertainment and art. Um, there's something about going to the movies. You make go to the movies, you make a choice, you make a commitment. You're gonna go see Oppenheimer, you're gonna sit there for three hours and watch Oppenheimer. If you're streaming the first five minutes of Oppenheimer, you're like, oh, I don't know. I don't, you know, you, and you'll go watch watch um, an episode of a, of a sitcom that you've watched 10 times before. Or, or you'll never find Oppenheimer because the algorithm in its in its intention to keep you watching all the time will just keep feeding you stuff that it thinks that you want to watch. So the process of discovery, of critical thinking, of discernment, the sense of adventure that is an important part of movie going, of consuming any art form, is really diminished and blunted by streaming. And I think that that we have all, we're only beginning to see what a real problem that that has been, what a, what a kind of a Trojan horse has been smuggled in with our subscriptions to all these wonderful platforms that have all of this wonderful content for us. Not to denigrate your successors as movie critics, but you say the real measure of success and failure in the movies is money. Uh, why is that when we read so much into criticism, into the blurbs of what critics say about movies? Well, it's just a, I mean, it's a blunt fact that that movies have have always been certainly um, in 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 this country a capitalist enterprise, and um, they cost an enormous amount of money to make 
and to distribute um, and to market, and they measure their success into how much they um, get back, and and they've figured out um, the the various companies, the movie studios, and and the and the conglomerates that have succeeded them, and the and the streaming countries have companies have have tried to figure out how to get more of that money back. Um, and in a way, it, I mean, it's important for, I, I, I'm certainly not diminishing the importance of, of critics who exist as an independent voice at an angle um, away from that uh, um, emphasis on, on, on money. But it is true that movie criticism can feel like, and in some ways is, um, not only a species of art criticism, but a species of business journalism, of business reporting. You say they never made movies like they used to. What do you mean? I mean that there's always nostalgia, that someone will always say. I, 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 I quote you know, the famous line from Norma Desmond um, in, uh, in, 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 in Billy Wilder's um, Sunset Boulevard, um, where she says, you know, uh, the pictures got small. And she says she's a great silent movie goddess who's talking about the 1950s, um, which we now look at and we think, wow, you know, 1950, early 1950s, late 40s and 50s were, were an incredible era in, um, in, in movies, but felt to many people at the time, critics, uh, maybe not so much audiences, but people in Hollywood, um, critics, people who should have known and maybe should have known better, like a, a period of decline. And every period has been a period of decline. Mm -hmm. Every period that we now look back on as a great golden age, you can find someone writing an article saying, "There, it's terrible now, it's over. The movies are, 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 are bad. They're not what they used to be. And of course, my point was just they were never what they, they used to be. Um, hindsight and nostalgia has this way of winnowing out um, all of all of the, the 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 dross and just giving us the gold, and that's why it looks like a golden age. Now that you could watch movies just for fun, which ones are you looking forward to? Well, I have o over uh, one of one of the little um, perks of my long tenure as a film critic was that. I got a lot of DVDs just sent to me, and I got a lot of wonderful Criterion Collection DVDs and Blu-rays um, of um, of classic films, some of which um, I would like to rewatch, um, some of which I had never watched. So one of my great passions has always been Italian movies, um, and I have a whole lot of Rossellini and a whole lot of, of Fellini and a whole lot of Visconti and a whole lot of Italian horror movies um, and giallos from uh, from the 60s and 70s. Um, and so uh, I can program, you know, my own my own little Italian film festival and uh, and try to work on my Italian in the meantime. You don't think you'll get tired of watching movies, will you? Well, I certainly got tired of reviewing them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, but no, I don't think I'll get tired of watching them. Um, it's it's it is it is one of the great pleasures of uh, uh, of, of of modern life. And and uh, but I, I I am glad to 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 um, to spend my working hours um, reading books. You're not going to get tired of reading books now, are you? As a critic at large for the book review, that seems that seems unlikely. There are there are an, there are an awful lot of books, and and I can't often think of anything else to do with my time anyway. So it, it, it's, it suits me well, this, uh, this new gig. It'll be time well spent. One last thing, you say a number of movies fold in primal scenes of rapture uh, that's beyond counting. And you mentioned Babylon, Emperor of Light, uh, The Hand of God. What makes those so special? Well, I think that they're, those are recent movies um, which look back at the movie past and sort of imagine moments of magic. Ba Babylon is, is, is about um, the silent era and that, that golden age of, of, of Hollywood. The Hand of God by the Italian um, director Paolo Sorrentino is about his own memories as a, as a young kind of movie mad um, adolescent in, in the 1980s, which most people remember as anything but a golden age of movies. But there is a sort of a feeling in these movies um, and in others, you know, Cinema Paradiso is, is a great example that comes to mind, where um, there's just a kind of a, 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 a rapture and enchantment and magic attached to the movies. And movies love that as a subject. 
Movies will never get tired of making movies about the magic of movies, about rediscovering it and in a way re-mythologizing um, their own their own power, their own their own charisma, their own glamour, um, as a way of 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 keeping it going. Um, and and I think that 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 they succeed. That 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 movies like that, when they succeed, connect with something in the viewer um, that that responds to to the to the power of the images and just the feeling of being of being transported of, of the way that 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 a movie creates a whole other world kind of both on the screen and in your mind at the same time hey yo scott new uh, critic at large for the new york times book review thank you for joining us and coming up next i'll share some thoughts on celebrating new york America is gearing up to commemorate the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. You wouldn't know it, but the Declaration had deep historical roots in New York. General George Washington first read it to his troops in Lower Manhattan. A decade earlier, representatives of the 13 colonies convened at New York City Hall to oppose the stamp tax and took their first overt steps toward union. In 1770, six weeks before the Boston Massacre, the first blood of the revolution was shed on Lower Manhattan's Golden Hill. In the lead up to America 250, though, there's another anniversary that official New York, much less most New Yorkers like you and me, seems to have almost forgotten so far. 2024 begins what would be, if anyone cared, a commemoration of the founding 400 years ago of what became the city of New York. Like most things in New York, the dates are fungible. The city's official seal used to be embossed with 1664. That's the year the British seized New Amsterdam. In 1974, though, Paul O'Dwyer, the Irish-born and anglophobic city council president, seized upon the 700th anniversary of the founding of Amsterdam in the Netherlands to expunge 1664 from the city's official seal and flag and replace it with 1625 to roughly coincide with the arrival of the Dutch in Manhattan. In fact, though, the first settlers had arrived on Governor's Island in 1624. Peter Minuit's mythical purchase of Manhattan occurred in 1626. The city was incorporated in 1653, still far earlier than most of its North American counterparts. Anyway, you might ask, what's to celebrate? What with homelessness, migrant overload, budget cuts, random crime, congestion, the scarcity of unaffordable housing. First, after COVID and other crises, we could use a party, even if it's unlikely to match the 1909 Hudson Fulton celebration. That extra extravaganza probably had more to do with solving the city's pride than with promoting Hudson. Some years before, Chicago had stolen New York's thunder by hosting the Columbian Exposition, the 400th anniversary of Columbus's voyage. But a commemoration doesn't necessarily have to be a celebration. It can also be a time of reflection, a time to remember that this resilient city of immigrants, this capital of capital, has come back from the brink before. It has disproved the doomsayers, not simply by celebrating the past or wallowing in the present, but by imagining the future and by seizing it. For the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.